thank you, Alice, uh, for um, inviting us to this talk, and, and thank you to Peter Merkley uh, for for um, including us in this format uh, with the title um, "For the Love of Architecture." When um, when Oliver and I were approached about doing this, um, we thought that love would be about you know um, about loving architecture, but also loving people, other people who do architecture, about friendship. And, um, and we thought it's, it shouldn't be just about, you know, um, two people doing their own work, but it should be about exchange and affection. And so we, for a long time, we, Oliver and I, we are interested in, in or even nostalgic about that old exchange between the US and Europe. In architecture, where there was a for a long time until the 80s or maybe early 90s, there was a mutual affection between between the two continents, where where um, Europe was kind of projecting certain things on the U.S. and certain searching for certain things, and vice versa. And and we thought we could redo this. And of course, it can only work when there's when it works. On a on a personal level, and it was so. Uh, it was very clear for us that we would ask um, Hilary and Michael, um, friends of us, whose work we really admire, um, whether they would be part of this conversation. Um, for us, um, and maybe we can start this conversation by by saying what we why we why we love their work so much. Um, it's um, <laughs> and it's maybe it's embarrassing, but um, it, it's um, it's about um, uh, we for us America and American architecture is a it stands almost symbolically for a for a directness of of the profession for a profession that can do huge bold things and that can um, but that can also architecture that is physically very direct. And we, of course, we think of, for example, the early work, the early work of, of Frank O'Gary, where he took the, um, uh, the American way of doing just normal houses with the two by fours, and he trans transformed it into, into something that would be um, artistic, architectural, and practical at the same time. And for a long time, we, um, uh, we felt that this um, directness was lacking in a lot of practices in the US. And suddenly we stumbled across um, Hillary and, and, and Michael's work. And we were like, wow, this is a new voice. And we, we, we thought that their work was somehow um, taking the brushes and the paint. If, if, you, if you, as a method, uh, you would take the normal stuff of the US, the normal way of how you do architecture in America and turn it into something that, was, that is powerful and strong and poetic. Um, that's why we, um, and of course in, the, in Switzerland, we are practicing in Switzerland, Oliver and I, we totally lack that, that directness. We cannot do a direct building. If we would, um, if we would do a, um, um, a building that would aspire the kind of shack-like quality of some of the most beautiful of your projects, then we would um, end up spending tons of money concealing complicated details, like many of our colleagues did and do for, for you know, as architects. Um, so, so it's it, it's this uh, this incredible directness that we love so much. Is that true that, that it would be more difficult to do? Like this kind of let, let's say direct uh, detailing or almost a vernacular. I mean, I, I think of your work as I mean there, there is a lot of uh, similarities in a way in, in sympathies between our work, and in some ways I feel like we are maybe um, we do have some European influences as well as as American. And for sure, we feel really in, indebted to like kind of American construction. I think this is like, you know, the, the neoliberal, like global culture of architecture doesn't, it sort of produces a lot of images, but it, it doesn't really uh, help you build stuff. So you'll see like something from somewhere else. In Switzerland, you'll see uh, totally cast in place concrete houses. Mm -hmm. And you'll think like, oh, anybody, you know, it's possible. And then you, if someone tries to do that in the U.S., 
you learn pretty quickly that's incredibly expensive or impossible depending on where you are. Um, and in your work, it's, you know, what I appreciate about it is also this kind of layering of, of it and the directness of the material. It's not, when I, when I used to think of Swiss work, it would be the cast, in, it would be like the all concrete monolithic thing. And yours is layers and layers of material and the material is very direct and not, um, and you understand the layering of it in a way thing I feel like in some, at least in some of the work that I, I know. Yeah. Um, um, Oli you want to say something about because the, our, our ground material that we worked with when you started was was the cheapest way to build in Switzerland which is um, um, a core in, in masonry and partially in concrete and that is covered with uh, outer insulation with styrofoam and, and just a millimeter of, of kind of um, stucco out on the outside like an eggshell and that was, uh, that is kind of, it's really a kind of depressing way to work because you, you have the most permanent core that you can possibly think of. And the last finish is the most, the cheapest and the most kind of degrading and depressing. Um, so, um, yeah, but, but, but Thomas, it's yeah. not, it's not depressing. It's, it's like a Virgil Abloh sneaker. Right? <laughs> it's like, you know, your, your foot's going to last for, hopefully 80 years or 70 years or whatever, but you're going to change your sneakers all the time. I mean, not you because you're wearing mostly leather shoes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was a liberation for us in a way because um, the concrete was just not possible. Our clients wouldn't afford it. They wouldn't pay for that. Um, yeah. And so we had to find a way to work with it. Um, and I mean, probably they, these facades will last at least for 20 years, I hope, or they could even last longer, who knows. Um, but that was kind of part of the deal. Um, and uh, instead of working with, with material or with mass, uh, all of a sudden we, we had to work with form, with, but with thin form, with surface. Um, and that kind of took us out of the, this, this legacy or also this burden um, of kind of continuing something you, you might run out of ideas anyhow. And, and that kind of created a gap in which others, um, you know, tried with, with paint or with weird elements to, to still think of, uh, make these buildings look as if they would be massive. And, and maybe because we were a bit moralistic or maybe because we were just interested in, in the idea of, of making of building with styrofoam or, or also maybe because we thought let's let's just be maybe I wouldn't say we were provocative Thomas but we were just ambitious and we just wanted to do something so we were not whining about or fighting with the clients for a better facade but uh, trying to make the best out of it and we discovered so many things in that um, like plasticities that 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 came just out of folded surfaces for instance and it was also Oliver. It was also a generational problem because we 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 both worked for Diener and Diener, and, and um, oh, wow. yeah, Roger Diener did these fantastic urban urban buildings that stand as sit there as if they have been there forever. You know? This incredible yeah. stability and muteness and this big beauty, and they need material weight for their existence yeah. and so of course you can't continue if you if you learn with roger diener you can't continue on this path otherwise you're bankrupt so you need to scare to shed all these this weight you know of your of, of, of yeah. this person huh? that was so important did you have a generational uh, um, conflict both of you because you, yes, you, be you yeah because you both you of you grew up in this uh, overly theoretical yeah. generation you know? How did you how did you cope with that? I, for, for sure, I mean, um, I mean, we were coming at it a little bit differently. I think a lot of our teachers were. It was all it was theory, and it was like a digital, sort of complex. It was all about complexity, uh, kind of digital form. Um, it was about, I, I would say, kind of expressionism of of technique um, 
you know, like how, what can you do like uh, in, in terms of uh, drawing and 3D modeling and CAD and stuff and the parametrics, let's say parametric modeling to make these kind of crazy swoopy things. And I, I think for us, we just, we tended to look toward, we wanted to build and, and similar to you, we learned from, from contractors and building and being in a way a little bit outside of the school. I mean, we, we do write and we do think <laughs> about architecture and um, you know, things like this, but our teachers, our teachers at least were, I would say less interested in building. They were more, they were trying to design at the high, like to work and hope the world would catch up with them, you know, design like the most advanced crazy things and then hope that the world will be able to eventually do it or you get lucky, you win the lottery with a, a kind of wonderful client mm -hmm. and, and build this, your, your fantasies. I think we just started working with, you know, average, let's say similar situation, people who probably didn't really care about architecture. Um, I think some of our clients are still like this. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and you try to just do the most you can with it and work with it. And you learn along the way and you learn, you know, locally talking to the, the framer or the contractor, uh, you know, and, and try to understand how to operate within it. I think the one thing that we also share, and we've talked about this before in, in other contexts is, is the models, large models. And I think that came from, for us, Hillary, Hillary has, uh, in terms of lineage, I suppose, uh, Hillary worked for Ram Cool House and, and I don't know if you wanted to kill him or not, but like the, <laughs> but, like the but that influenced us for sure. And to some degree of like large models, and working through a model, the model in the office. For sure, I think, well, I've always been interested in models, but working in the office at that time around 2000 was a really, I think, so instructional and pivotal moment for me and then ultimately for us in practice, um, not just working with REM, but everyone who was in the office at the time and the kind of, was all buildings and a lot of projects in the US. So that I think was, um, the office changed pretty radically just a year or two after that time um, and it you know, kind of started doing projects really all over the world at that moment so it was very interesting to see the kind of exchange between the US and Europe and and working in two different offices at the same time basically in San Francisco and in, in Rotterdam and and that was interesting I think it's, it's also about just the kinds of projects. I think one thing that has become more apparent the older I get and the more we do in practice um, and what you do a lot of is housing. And mm. for us, even that was so taboo. You know, you, it wasn't mm. ar considered architecture. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed and it wasn't taught in school. Um, and, you know, this is something we've had to, in a way, learn on our own and then also just really understand the system here, which is incredibly limiting Horrible. and challenging. And, mm -hmm. you know, basically the, the best housing work is done perhaps because you maybe have a very well-educated underwriter. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> that is, you know, to, to, to think about how you, how you can present things. But I, for me, I love your work in housing and the, among other things, of course, but for me, I'm especially drawn to the way you're thinking about um, what you know what you're presenting on the outside versus then as you say even in some of the writing you know moving into the inside and thinking about that exchange as and being part of a housing community but the the kind of material invention and and just joyfulness and um i, I think is such a delight and and so I think hard to find in a lot of housing work. So for that, I, I really am so drawn to the projects and I get very excited thinking about, you know, just even also there's this kind of moment where you show a staircase, but it's all about how that transforms from the drawing and becomes three-dimensional. And mm -hmm. that for sure is something we're really interested in as well in, in drawing and how that goes into architecture. And, and at the moment of housing, it's, I think, fantastic.
<laughs> I guess we've yeah, already... I think I'm trying to think of similarities and stuff. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah it... no, just the, the housing thing. I mean, I think we're very, very lucky in Switzerland and especially in Zurich that there's an, an amazing competition systems where young practices like ours can participate. You can actually win a competition and then you can actually build it in, with good conditions. And so, but so this is kind of a political system that has been established yeah. by former generations here in Switzerland, which we profit a lot from, and yeah. in which then we we find a certain wiggle room where we can do things that 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 that, that do what you describe. Yeah, but that's really, uh, I know in the U.S. it's it's so different. We're so jealous. Yeah, yes. we are so jealous. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's like for us, we rely on developers mm. a lot of times, and and you know, they're really, let's say the motivation of developers isn't always, um, it's always, it's, it's sometimes just money. And so they'll make yes. decisions based on, you know, ultimately not on what is best, but what is best for their profits. Yeah. So- um, That's just a very complex system of parts that have to be assembled and timing of funding. And mm -hmm. so even though there may be funding in the future that's coming, yeah. it's not available for the moment of building. And so, um, you know, substitution of materials happens um, yeah. and, you know, and then it's as though it's the architect's decision and society mm -hmm. thinks it's the architect, but it's not. And so it's really, you know, how do we begin to, to work against that system? And so, you know, thinking strategically about what materials and what kind of detailing um, and, you know, understanding there are limitations in, in that, um, but, you know, that there are abilities to work through things like, um, you know, different unit types and variation in the plan and repetition and where there's exchange in that and, you know, just even the, the kind of size of windows, um, you know. Is, uh, and that's something in your work, I think, is, yeah. is really amazing to look at the great with scale, the difference. And, yeah. yeah. I think the, I think there is something going on right now where as opposed to when, let's say when we were students or like that moment Hillary was talking about of um, when we were working for others is that there is a kind of interest I feel, I don't know if this is true, where like these, the, the super extreme architecture or the more, uh, yeah, these extreme gestures or these extreme instances of kind of uh, impossible architecture that gets built seems less interesting to a lot of people at the moment because it's unattainable. Like you can't do it. And, and I think that people are more interested in now in things that are more attainable, have a certain economy to them, can be implemented and done in real life, not just for a few, but for, mm -hmm. for many. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that our, both of our work sort of fits within that broader kind of movement in the field um, at the moment. I don't know. But I have to say that um, I'm envious of you. <laughs> um, because um, um, when I look at the work, um, especially the um, the, the houses you you have been designing and also building these houses in these houses you um, I can understand that you are working within very constraints and precise limits maybe of budget and ways of constructions materials repetitions and so on but you have a way of making those constraints seem disappear it's amazing and then what happens is you you end up with a um, a figural house that has a in an amazing space around it, where the the space making of America is very present. We have a way of making space where you have to squeeze in like in a crowded bar between the next one, and you know see that we don't touch the shoulder of the next one. You sometimes have space where you can claim, you know, an acre of land, you know, by a, with a small building with your building, that's amazing. And then what happens is that you end up, when you look, when I look at your work, you end up with a, a typological collection of houses that seem to echo 
um, the country where they are built and a kind of vernacular echo space. Yes. And that's totally amazing to me. And what and these figures for me, it's it's something that that somebody like, you know, um, um, Aldo Rossi was doing for Italy where he was he was claiming that that you know all these um, buildings that he did were somehow part of a language you know and part of a collection of types and for me if i go into um, you know i have been living in upstate new york for some time when i go to some of these villages you know i would certainly see of some of your buildings or brothers or cousins of your buildings you know yeah. and recognize them but you would turn them into something sublime uh, and I think that's amazing. So for me, you are. You, have you? Do you have a special relationship to this kind of Rossian take on the on the kind of collection of buildings? Is that true, or is it just an interpretation? No, I, th I think sense. there's something there. There's this nice story about Rossi teaching at Yale. I heard when I was a student and young teacher. I was always, I'm always obsessed, as I'm, I'm sure you are. I have a feeling there's like these stories that were told from people ahead of us about the field at the time or from their about their teachers and what was going on. And the, there was somebody I was working with was talking about this, this uh, Rossi taught a studio at Yale, it was, I think his only studio and it was on New England buildings. And he was obsessed with kind of the New England type. And of course it echoes for him, some of his own work uh, in there as well. Like he would, you know, looking at shakers or, or you know, like these kinds of, very stripped down New England uh, salt box type buildings. And, and I think there's th that kind of connections are, are inevitable. And I'm sure even in our own work that is, I, I would say always though, between, <laughs> personally, I've always liked Rossi better than Rossi. <laughs> if I had to pick between the two, just for the hardcore ness of, of Rossi. <laughs> but um, and there's something yes. a little bit, <laughs> A little bit too um, romantic in Rossi or saccharine sometimes for me, but like the um, Grassi was always more. And the problem was he never was really tran translated into. He ne I don't think he spoke English or he was never really translated as well. But he wrote great. He wrote these amazing texts. Also, I don't know if you like on cabinet makers and craft. Grassi. I mean, he was just a great thinker or is. So um, I don't know where we go from there, but the I, I know <laughs> because I studied I studied one semester with Giorgio Grassi in, oh, you did? in Lausanne. Yes, yes, it was fantastic. <laughs> but actually, I think he's an amazing architect, as you say, um, and he's an amazing writer. And also, a lot of this, this there's been translations into German, and I think even he wrote in German because his his wife, I think, is German. Um, but as a professor, he was rather mute. <laughs> oh, <was> he? <laughs> he didn't really like to talk too much. Like he would make lectures and show his projects. And those were amazing. Yeah. But, you know, just talking about the designs of the students, that, that wasn't really his thing. And he couldn't do it. But he just, did he grunt? There's these stories also about Mies was like this. Like when he would teach, he would just sort of grunt or something or, you know, like kind of no, sit no, there you, you for like an hour at some detail. Mm -hmm. But, but, but we changed the project once, like su substantially. And then he looked at it and he's like, what kind of project is this? And then we're like, yeah, it's this and that project. And he's like, yeah, no, but I don't see a project. I'm, I'm not talking about this. <laughs> and that was the crit. <laughs> and then it was clear. Oh, we went, we went one I step far. Huh? We, we kind of you can't do that anymore. <laughs> no, you, you can't do that, that anymore, huh? <laughs> no, you can't. I don't even think you could. I, what would happen? And my, my partner, she started crying because we yeah. worked so much. And, and I thought I understood what he meant. And of course I thought, yeah, come on. But, but okay. Um, yeah, it was, it was funny. Um, but yeah, yeah he's an amazing you can't teach like this anymore. Like, I think there was a thing where you, I mean, that's a kind of also a very maybe patriarchal kind of thing or something. I don't know what it is, but it's a, it's a certain model that I just don't think can exist anymore. Right? No, no. no. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm glad that doesn't exist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hillary, I'm with you. I suffered yeah. so much as a student. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. No, but I can I can see what you say. Um, 
um, Michael about Grassi and Rossi. I mean, this one building he built in a kind of New England style in the U.S. is really, I think, it's really terrible. It's a kind of, I, 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 I really yeah. don't like it. Of, yeah, that was a phase where it was getting a little too, um, yeah, saccharine. I don't know how else to describe it, but a little too mm. cutesy in a way. I, I'm not against the, you know, I like cute, but it's somehow cutesy. Mm -hmm. There's something like cute to me is more of a proportional thing. Cutesy is like a, a kind of picturesque uh, mm -hmm. assemblage thing. Mm -hmm. no, I was also thinking in terms of Rossi about your work more about the Rossi, you know, when you look f from very far away to the thought of Rossi, you know, what he thinks about the city, you know, and what memory, the role that memory plays you know, in architecture and how yeah, you can tap into a kind of deep space of memory. And that deep space ex uh, consists of, of everyday memories and lived memories and memories from books, and they all come together. And I, I, I feel that, um, how, do you, how do you operate between this ambition and, and the, the kind of reality what you tell the clients, you know? Is it, um, it we, I mean, we have the same, we have the same kind of problem, probably every architect has that problem, but um, do, is there, um, do you have anybody to talk about this, you know? <laughs> no, it's true, like, who do you talk, who do, how do you, what do you share with your client and things mm -hmm. like this? I, I think that we talk about it a little bit, but we don't probably talk about it as much. Mm -hmm. Like, we'll talk about type and we'll talk about uh, the vernacular and how we, we, t we sometimes start by just looking at the buildings around mm -hmm. uh, an area that we're working and talk about them with them. Yeah, that's true. I, th I think we've been very lucky in the house projects that we've had. You know, for us, it's also about hopefully a little bit complicating things in a way that, you know, from a house that floats to one that's completely off the grid and is really a visitor guest house for a museum. They're, they're maybe not, they're not um, a kind of typical house. Sing, they, they're- Yeah, programmatically. Yeah, programmatically, they're mm -hmm. not for a single family per se, but that also affects then their, um, the parts and the mm -hmm. way that they aggregate and always we've had just, fantastic landscapes to work in. Mm -hmm. um, so that speaks to us, I think, in a way that it's not about seeing that landscape all of the time, but being strategic in your relationship to it from the inside. So at times you're up close to a tree and other times maybe you see mm -hmm. the panorama, mm -hmm. but each of those builds on, on the next one. So I think as we, we go through, we try to reimagine how the house can be used and and certainly in this past year <clears throat> for everyone we've seen how a house or housing um, is doing more than just cooking and sleeping and becoming a school becoming all yeah. sorts of all sorts of things mm -hmm. so this will i think radically change how all of us think about the future and and living i mean that, that's... in your work i think you said the word aggregate and, and you said that they're not typical single family houses. And um, I think, you know, whenever I look at any of your projects, I have the feeling I don't really see any program. Um, I mean, I know people live in it, but yeah. they could easily be something else. And, and what I find super fascinating is um, this, this idea of, of aggregation, or to me, it's almost like a gathering of, of different elements or, or people sometimes they touch sometimes they just barely touch and i think in a lot of your your projects that there, there isn't like a clear hierarchy you know they could yes. be yeah. there's also no composition i have the feeling i mean they're beautifully proportioned and everything has a lot of character but 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 i have seen they could be assembled in different ways and that's an incredible mm. liberty yeah and and 
that's nice. I think it's also so kind of a poetic idea in that, no? That that uh, it's a constellation that could be like this, but it could also be different. And maybe if it's different, it would still be the same because it's the same kind of elements meeting somehow. And you, and you know, Oliver, you know what the main condition I think is for these projects to be so successful? Uh, it's I think it's that they the the houses are not trying to do too much, you know. Maybe that has I to do think, with the program you're, you're referring to, Hilary. I don't know that they are not kind of typical houses that have to be super complete, you know, two garages, five bathrooms. Uh, I don't know what they need. Is that true? We, we don't really have, we have one house with a garage. I'm trying to think of like, we have garages in general, like that, which is very un, un American. We don't really, have, <laughs> uh, at some level, the garage is usually the front door for most. Yeah, that's right. um, yeah, no, and and programmatically, it's pretty, it's important, but it's also loose. Yeah. It's not. Well, it's kind of generic and just thinking yeah. about mm -hmm. intersection of it with building. And it kind of happens like the, sometimes it just happens in little nooks and crannies mm -hmm. of things mm -hmm. and stuff like this. But um, I'd say the, the, the thing about composition and, and how arrangement of things, I think is true in, in your work as well. Mm -hmm. I don't want to, just talk about us, it's embarrassing. But like the, but for sure, I would say there is a kind of, also the, the one thing I would say that is that is interesting is like there is a kind of non-compositional, but there is also this, and I think we share this, uh, the interest in where things flip from like being nothing into something. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and this kind of edge that you ride right. of between nothing and something. I don't know how this is very abstract language, but like, I, I like where, let's say the, the butterfly roof, as we call it, becomes a cat or something in your case, I'm trying to think of like the, or a face, a facade becomes a face. I think these are all things that are this kind of, you don't want to anthropomorphize, but this moment that rides it, or at least I, I, I don't, I think is like the, you know, this moment where it's like in between things. It's like, it is like a figure of something, but it is also nothing, or it's just a grid, or it's just a, and it's, you know, something like this, I think is an interesting um, condition, sort of. I feel that in your work, I may be. Yes, no, no, you're right. And I think we also share this idea of, of aggregation uh, of things. I think Thomas yeah. and I were not really aware of that until Nevin Fuchs asked after a lecture in Oslo, he said, you know, you speak about architectural elements, you speak about ideas, but you never speak about space. And then we realized <laughs> we never speak about space, you know, yeah. but we speak of what is the column doing next to this kind of window and, and, and how, how do they relate, what kind of energy they create. And ultimately this is what space, what defines space. But we yeah, don't have a right. kind of idea of, of space as being, uh, you know, a volume or something like that. It's it's a, it's an aggregation of. I love elements. that. Actually, I think that's yeah. true. Like space is such a strange and mysterious word that people use all the time. But really, it's just made up of things and stuff and a, and you know, things next to each other. Um, yeah, that's true. It's true. Um. We are. We have a, um, another thing that is going on in our office at the moment. We feel that um, our, some of the projects we are working on now are somehow um, having fewer elements and have the tendency to to be less less defined programmatically and. I feel that you, the two of you are ahead of us in this respect, you know, a bit more mature, you know. We, we, um, <laughs> for, for, we always had this obsession of ex to explain everything, it, me especially as a person, you know? yeah. but also as a, rhetorically as an architect, you know. And maybe we can, we have now we are starting a next phase where we can let some things more loose, you know. And yeah. um, and I like I really admire that looseness, you know, where I don't where I look at the figure of some of your buildings that is so clear, and then the interior walls, it's like, 
who who did draw these interior walls you know yeah. <laughs> how can how can you possibly end up putting the kitchen like halfway there not yeah. like and and then i look at it and i i know gosh that's really hard to do that's really a lot of work you know that kind of looseness and that kind of deadpan and a rea rea appearance you know and it's almost you think as that your language yeah. has changed also i'm looking at like i feel like over time our language our literally our language has changed of how we describe the work and how we talk about the work for our, you know like it's become more shorter sentences or something mm -hmm. or Direct. more direct also <laughs> I, is this happening for you too i feel like your language is very particular also when you how you describe things on like on your website at least because we were looking at the website before <laughs> you know like going and it's there is a kind of a bluntness to it which i really like and um it's also maybe something we we share but i, I know it's different as individuals and especially if you're a teacher and talking like you said mm -hmm. to clients i mean you 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 our guys are the most articulate and wonderful critics on reviews all the time. I always think it's you're very, very articulate and very sensitive to what the student is trying to do, and um, and make it pleasurable. And make it pleasurable. Also. Yeah, <laughs> it's not the grassy. Yeah. It's not that grassy moment or whoever. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, but it's evident in the work. Yeah, it's evident in the work. Well, right? Yeah. There's a thoughtfulness and a quietness to it, but it's also, it, it's said with not, it's not said w with large uh, fanfare, you know what I mean? It's sort of very simply stated, I feel like. Thank you so much. But the bluntness, you know, talking about bluntness, of course, you have a whole culture of, of you know, bluntness uh, and, and um, direct um, yeah. language in the U.S., to, yeah, to fall back it. on. Yeah. I mean, no. <laughs> so not no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic. Yeah. No, Michael, I'm not being sarcastic. I mean it. I mean, there's a whole culture. I mean, literature that goes like dark, yeah. like yeah. boom, yeah. boom, of boom. Course. No, and that's wonderful. I mean, that's uh, also the the, um, the the kind of the, the directness. And um, I mean, I can imagine that for us, it was incredibly hard work to get away from the kind of convoluted language, you know. Of, of some of the academic you know world you know yeah. in, into into that bluntness you know and i mean is that must have a direct relationship to to your work right oh my gosh if you go back and read now do you go, i was just recently going back and re reading uh i don't know if i should be calling out names for any of these things but, <laughs> but michael hayes is uh architectural theory after 1968 and i was just going through the book and rereading it and i and i was just thinking to myself Thank goodness we don't write like this anymore. It's just so. <laughs> Did you have it there? Yeah, it just goes through. It's like. Yeah. I, but yeah. You know what I really like this. Like, <laughs> and I think this is maybe true at that one time. There was one moment in there where he's talking about, like, um, and I think this is why I was reading. It was on real, the realism, the move. And it was this, uh, who was it again? Uh, Hugh, Hewitt or something uh, on realism and architecture. And it was so. Ref I thought, well, maybe this is what we're doing now. It's kind of a little bit of like a return to realism or something. I was trying to understand, looking mm -hmm. back at this stuff, thinking about where we are at the moment. Mm -hmm. And if, but um, there's a kind of sense of trying to really look at things in the world more. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I feel, I feel um, um, Michael, that this, this, this tendency that you describe is really uh, gives us gives us a lot of keys for the, the these these needs of the future to think about you know economies um how how do we use um uh, resources huh? yeah and how do we what is specific what is generic you know what can you use for what you know and i think that's um i feel that the tendency to this tendency that you described to to be more generous about how life relates to what you do and to be more relaxed is at the same time super economical huh? because it's 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 opening up things you know you can you are use the spa one space maybe a garage but maybe it's your living room you know? we don't know huh? 
and maybe it's going to be either one over time. You know? um, we we have a we have a pro we have a project at, just we have a project at the moment that is trying to do this. It's a kind of you know we do a two story loft apartments where we have only a platform in the middle and the spiral staircase and no walls, no separation wall, just a small bathroom. And, and we, and this in, a, in terms of program form relationship, it's very close to your work, I find. Huh? Um, we love this project. We were just talking, this is one we were talking about before Hillary was talking. Yeah, the, the step one, yeah, you, yeah. You, how do you say it, Swat? Swat, Swat, yeah. yeah. What? <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. It's in a master plan by Peter Mackley, by the way. Um, oh, is it? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you, in the introduction text to your book, The, the Casas, no? yeah. about the houses, you say, I, I hope I quote right, um, we never cared about the language of architecture. And, and then the next one is, we never heard what it was saying <laughs> or what architecture <laughs> was saying. <laughs> I thought that is, it was fantastic. Um, yeah, but I mean, is that really true? I mean, is that even possible? I was wondering. Well, I think language in the in the in the in the moment when we were like the semiotic sense or something like this. I, I think I think it's it's more complex because those who write about it are very smart and they've figured out the way around it. So I'm I'm probably mischaracterizing certain things, but um, but the the idea that it's that there is a a, a clear system of, of that is linguistic, like like language to me has always been strange. I mean, we always use it as shorthand. I understand technique, I understand construction, I understand uh, other things that are, let's say language-like, but it's not really language. Like, I don't know what it means a lot of times buildings. Like I know they mean something and I they, they mean something to us individually. Probably, but I, it's not going to be as clear as a um, as a text, I think. But I, I could be wrong. I mean, I don't know. The one thing I do to to go back to the lo the love and Peter Peter Markley because he's up here in the master plan. Also, I suppose is um, the I think there is something about learning. And this is maybe the problem of the language as well. It's just learning how to to love the things around you a little bit and try to find a way to work with them mm -hmm. and, and finding pleasure in some of the most common experiences. I mm -hmm. think that is really important. Uh, and so, you know, language to me always seemed very... Um, probably it's, it's also for effect a little bit elite. Like, I don't think most people experience buildings or I don't even think, like, I, I don't expect anyone to, I, I sort of believed in a little bit more in the Maneos, like uh, the solitude of buildings, I suppose, mm -hmm. text. It's like, you know, you don't know the architect, you don't know really what people are thinking or saying, you just experience the building. Um, and, and I, I think I take, I think that's okay. I think that's not a bad thing. I don't mind that we also make up these stories about them ourselves and when we talk to each other, you know, and things like this, I think that's also okay. But I, the idea that you, you approach a, a building and there's a kind of um, mutinous to it to some degree. I mean, I don't know, I, I, my head spins because I think I kind of think of the counter arguments constantly while I'm talking, but um, but like, um, what does it say? Like, what does Watt say to somebody? Do you think? I don't know. Yeah, but it's it's very interesting that you know you seem to, you, both of you historically you seem to come you know from a background where where language was was really present and overwhelming and also maybe um, was was taking over other um, other um, aspects that are important to architecture. While we came from a background of the kind of um, grand Swiss architecture of the 90s where abstraction and muteness you know was very very dominant so for us it was we were uh, people were really shocked when when, when and found it 
quite rhetorical when we um, when we introduced um, um, form and facades and expression in facades with very cheap means. Huh? And there was a, a long period of 10 years where um, we didn't hear from Roger Diener, no? Um, no, is that right? Uh, oh, yes. I'll tell you the same things are like, for us, like, like the pitched roof. I, we still get grief because yeah. we have a pitched roof. We use yeah. pitched roof. Uh, colleagues of ours and friends of ours are always like, they just get so worked up about it. They hate the pitched roofs because pitched roofs for them are identified with a semiotic language rhetorical it's a rhetorical device and i'm just always like you know if you want to build in the northeast and yes. you have a certain economy you're going to end up with a sloped roof a pitched roof i'm sorry it's just how it is and you know it's like and try to make something of it is like mm -hmm. the thing it's like you try to make some of it but mm -hmm. like it causes such angst, angst. yeah it causes such yeah. angst with our colleagues that the pitched roof people really hate it and they attack us for it. That's also why in that text, I think talked a little bit about the kind of, the language was also tied to like a kind of uh, postmodernism, which I think probably in mm -hmm. Switzerland, you, this is probably what Diener, Diener thinks when they look at your work, they feel like it's, the rhetorical is tied to a kind of earlier model of, mm -hmm. of postmodernism. Right. Which I don't, I just don't, see in our work honestly i don't see it the same i don't see it in your work either so no. but other people of a certain generation d do see it sometimes for whatever reason like like a pitched roof causes such anxiety for some people um but in your case i think the games are are kind of to me they're like kind of classic architectural games of scale mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like those are kind of enduring in the as like what you can do as an architect mm. um you know to an arrangement of things and how to play with material and how to play with uh, form just even the, the looking at swat even just this, the oversized shingle the uh siding and then it popping out and becoming an awning all these things are kind of the oversized cap at the top all this stuff is like great it's like super it's super sophisticated and not at the same time and seemingly done with pleasure yeah and i think also the going back to your michael you said something about layering as you the more you look also the more you discover about the work as we've we haven't had the pleasure to visit in person but I hopes to someday, <laughs> but as we, you know, look at and, and, you know, the models, it's also wonderful the way even you photograph them because you have a sense of the overall form, but only slightly. And as you look through then the, the details of construction, you, you get, you zoom in and, and you see more of the thinking and the, the, the kind of carefulness in the way things change from a texture to maybe smooth or introduction of color. Which I is, love the side. Which is so delightful. It's so nicely done. Proportions are so good. Anyways, we're looking at it right now. And the color, it is interesting that the front and the back and the side and everything is sort of, is different. I think that also would be uh, like you said, on on Swiss of a certain yes generation. yes yeah. that was, yeah that was actually one of what you discovered in in one of our first projects through the models that when you when you build a model and you you rip off um, facades to to replace them and and to glue them on again and then you do this again and again and again then you realize that, that there's really a dialogue between the facades and that they only meet at the corners. So, so I mean, the, the main paradox of architecture is that you are doing volumes and surfaces at the same time, huh? because if they all, these volumes are always inhabited. Um, so it sounds banal, but that was quite a discovery for us. Huh? And that, that somehow, um, that 
the, the instinct of our training would be that you have, have to somehow harmonize or orchestrate the different sides. Huh? And our, our, what we, what we um, found out in our work together that, that the opposite is the case. Huh? Just let them lose, you know. They, they will find, you know, when you have two people who are different and they meet like facades, they have a relationship. Huh? That's it, you know, they're different. Each one is an individual, but they can have a relationship. That's fine, you know? And the relationship will turn out the way the, the chemistry between these two, um, uh, it's just happened. There's a strong uh, form that they're on still that, that holds it all together. Like the... In the yeah, yeah, in that case, yeah, certainly. Um, in other cases, we had buildings, like in the second building we did in Wenkenstraße, it was the ugliest volume you can possibly imagine because it was dictated by the, by the building code and by the additions you could do legally on the roof. And you have to, of course, maximize the surface because yeah. the land is so expensive in Switzerland. So that we, you had to turn a kind of ugly volume, an unthinkably ugly volume into a piece of architecture, like dress it up like architecture. That's very op That's not what you were doing. That's a very strange. No, we, for sure, we didn't have that. I mean, but at some level, I think I still think of. Um, it's funny the the things we carry around with us because I, I do think of architecture probably more like the Diener and Diener that you were describing before as like an object in a city, a kind of civic building mm -hmm. in a city, and and we just have never been able to get to it. So we've never really been able to do architecture in our mind. We haven't gotten there yet. We keep wanting to. Um, but someday. But still, I think we, we share a sensitivity where form is more about negotiation and, and less about a hierarchy or like a clear system. And I think that's something which is very contemporary and, and also resonates in, in society. In general, no, that, that things are about negotiation, there's opposites, there's distance, but there's also proximity and, and friction, um, different energies. Um, and I don't know, I mean, it might sound a bit like too much of an interpretation, but you know, uh, if you think, if you, and Peter Merkley, he would say that architecture is a language of form. I think he even has lectures under that title. I think that's what makes your work and maybe our work different from, say, 50 years ago, where, where things were, were, were different, no? And, and, and society was different. And, you know, even when I look at your, your furniture, which I totally find totally amazing, you know, there's, there are always some kind of sturdy elements screwed together somehow. And then they all of a sudden, there's something happening with those small beams or whatever, there's a chair. Uh, and, and I think that is really amazing because it's, it's, it, it's, it's a poetry that has to do with negotiating things and, and not with just kind of shaping the world, no? But, but actually then, yeah. putting it together somehow. No? It's all, all the furniture really is sort of like the architecture in the sense that we just work from, uh, you know, kind of the, the cheapest means we could find so a lot of it is like we never well we didn't it's all bolted because welding is really expensive to grind it down and everything to smooth it out and so we just would assemble it and have it bolted together and you can rearrange it in other ways too in a way it doesn't become as precious perhaps as a thing um and we've always worked with aluminum and, and we've done some wood and we did some wood pieces recently where we worked with like the, they're like broomsticks. It's basically a broomstick maker mm -hmm. does all the legs and everything. And so they're, they're like the biggest broomsticks that the guy made basically. And so there's a certain economy to it. We just want, I, I, I was always against these really fancy, I mean, the problem is you, you can't avoid it because the furniture and the design world is so, is so difficult, just like architecture. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I, I can't stand these, uh, that an architecture table is twenty thousand dollars or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. it just seemed always to me like, who is this for? And so we always tried to work with really cheaply so that anybody could afford it and we can do it ourselves. We did a kitchen; it was the same 
uh, all out of bent metal. And it was like the same as Ikea, basically in the end for one of our projects. I mean, it was a little more labor in our in part. Terms of <laughs> 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 like material, cost, material cost is the same, like in terms of all the parts, um, but putting it together was a little more. Um, but yeah, well, I, I think definitely the interest in how architecture can be more for everyone than exclusive. Mm -hmm. And that is something for sure we've been, I've been interested in. And how, how do you engage in making things? Because it's, it's obviously not so easy and it takes time. And we've worked with a certain group of people that we've built up over years. I think this is also very much a part of, of practice and thinking about design, that who are you making the work with and how to, you know, how to have these conversations and, and make it more immediate. And it's, it is about, it does come back to directness as you guys were talking, I was thinking about that because the, you know, for us, it's, if we need something, we want to make it and <laughs> we don't want to just buy it but then we also don't have a lot of time. And so how do we, how do we do that? Yeah, it's pretty true. Yeah. I have a political question for you. Um, uh, the, um, you are, you're from New York and you are sometimes upstate and you're doing a lot of, um, most of your buildings in outside of the city. And, um, and there's this big um, you know, divide in America running through society and it's 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 in some cases it's also a kind of rural um city divide you know and um yeah. you could you couldn't your work play a role there a positive role you know that would be fantastic we're trying to i think yeah. we're trying to we're mm -hmm. trying to even figure out how to do more i think in the rural like to be able to affect like at the i think the we're, we, I mean, we live between the two for sure at the moment. I mean, we really do live in New York most of the time, but in the, in the summers, we go between the two. Um, the, and we, with our kids and everything. But I think the, the world could, I mean, it definitely there's a lot I could teach the city, I suppose, in some ways in terms of economy and construction and things like this. But at the same time, there's a lot to be learned out here and, and also to look at uh, I mean, architecture really is an urban project. I mean, it really is about cities and is it really about um, a kind of collective culture. And, the, and it, some of that needs to be brought maybe into the rural a little bit more. I feel like we're trying to do something. <laughs> we'll see, keep us posted. We're trying to do a small thing, you know, like a kind of little space in, the, in a rural setting for architecture. Well, I think this comes back to the accessible feeling that it's it's something for for everyone. How do you how do you feel? I guess um, maybe think is a better term, but uh, that you can relate or or feel it's for you. Right, the idea that maybe you can't go past a facade to something, um, and then it's also about methods of practice. And making things, and um, you know, just there's just fundamentally different ways of approaching things. In the city, it's, it's very much service based, right? You know, you're going mm -hmm. to hire contractors, and and you have to go through a certain set of policies and and legal things. Yeah. Whereas in the rural, it's more about really doing everything yourself and knowing mm -hmm. you can do it, mm -hmm. and not relying on others necessarily to help you and um, even if in the end you you still need you need help with things, but there's it's just a fundamentally a very different different mindset. At least that's that's how I see yeah, it. And right. and maybe perhaps also just being a woman in in architecture and practice, I can't you know uh, go through a day without uh, being reminded of that wherever I am, city or or a other place. And um, you know, and so I, I mean, just how, how do you? begin to to have conversations around making things mm -hmm. they're they're they, they start in different places usually mm -hmm. and so so that's very interesting for us to learn and i grew up more so in a kind of rural setting and and 
inspired by the, the kind of um, constraints around vernacular conditions or limitation of material mm -hmm. ways of making things, just a certain economy around that. I think in some of it is just like we're saying is, is also, you know, I, I think right now everything has become so atomized, like architecture is really um, needs to reach out more. I mean, we, we really are, you know, it's, it's sort of like everybody is uh, in their own, is there in their own bubbles or spaces or whatever. And um, it's hard for, it's hard to break that almost. Uh, and how do you reach out? How do you share, I guess, this, the, uh, our, the love of architecture with mm -hmm. others mm -hmm. and hope that they also, I guess also to learn from them as well, but like to how to share more and what architecture should be. I think we've been too long telling people what architecture is um in a way yeah maybe also just to build on that quickly but i think one thing we've tried to do in our practice is also do some pro bono work in projects and try to do at least one a year and think about how whatever that is we might do there it's usually more installation type work but um that it can be a project for architecture and that you learn more about architecture and that we invite other people to participate in that. And, uh, and we do make a lot of books. And so if, you know, the project will eventually be taken down and that's something we have concerns about too. And that's another conversation maybe, but, um, but that if it is a, a sort of limited time that it can live on in, in different ways. And, and part of that is through writing and, and book projects and inviting others to contribute. So we see that as a kind of extension and maybe one way to what you know what else can can we do for yeah, petite architecture yeah that, that's one like petite is like this mm -hmm. for us. yeah we we have the same feeling at the moment in switzerland that the ground is really shifting beneath our feet and that we that in order to reach out and to be more able to move and to change we we feel strongly that we have to shed a lot of things you know and and uh, leave behind a lot of things that are that we take for granted, you know, in a building. We are almost in Switzerland. The, the level of kind of finish and 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 the the, the need the, the the theoretical needs of the inhabitants is so overburdening that that the uh, the it seems that beautiful architecture comes out of it, but it's, it's becomes really standardized. So if you really want to question, you know, function, you know, um, use of use of resources, um, affordability in uh, for the young, for the for the age, you know, difference between different ages, um, um, the possibility of um, having different ways of living together, um, we cannot have this as an additional requirement on the already existing, you know, um, um, building market, but we somehow have to get rid of a lot of things, you know. And I feel, and this, the SWAT building is, is would have been unthinkable three years ago you know, um, in Switzerland. And it's only because of the, of the pressure of everybody knows that we have to change, you know. The investors knows we have to change. The building becomes so expensive in Switzerland that and the, the resource question, which could be, you know, the question of ecology or sustainable sustainability becomes an economical question. And so it's it's really interesting that we, we get the chance because everybody feels or all the people who are who are quite who know the field know that the given solutions won't be able to they are not functioning in the future. Yeah. So for us that's that to shed weight and to again to to become lighter you know to be able to move again yeah that that's definitely the future and you have your buildings out of necessity they have already this amazing lightness you know <laughs> sometimes um, you know they they, they have uh, inside they <laughs> and, and and you're overstressing in your in your drawings in your abstract plan drawings you're overstressing <laughs> it you know where you have three lines and it's like inside and it's okay that's the plan it's, this is probably yeah. the kitchen yeah? <laughs> <laughs> but, and, uh, but thomas it's, yeah? it's very different from you know reduction does not mean minimal right yeah 
Um, and and I think we all have an aversion um, against minimum yeah. and minimal architecture, which was very fashionable in the 90s, which yeah. resulted in a completely expensive and exclusive um, architecture. Whereas I think nowadays, and, and Hillary, you said it twice, I think that you try to make work for everyone and, and actually you're looking for an, in, an inclusive architecture and not an exclusive architecture. And although I've never visited one of your buildings, I mean, in fact, we haven't even met, you know, except yes, uh, online <laughs> reviews and, and writing uh, 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 conversations at night. Um, um, I have the feeling that, that, that your work has you know there's no it's not bound to any style you you can move in with moss furniture if you want but you can also bring your grandma's yes or or ikea stuff and it works right and um, and thomas and i we always discuss like if we can fit the, the really ugly flat screen television um, and if it doesn't work there's something wrong with the project right um you know just for normal people right and yeah. They, they, I'm not sure if they like the buildings in the end or not, um, but at least we do everything. So, to, to, as you said, to fill these these houses with love, um, and I think that's something that that people can feel when when something is made with care and and with energy and with delight. That some of it stays within the building. <laughs>